Oh, there it is, just a button at the yeah, top. At the bottom. Oh, yeah, I've done it, that's yeah, fine. I thought it, I thought it was more complicated than that, <laughs> sorry. Right, okay. Um, as I say, wave or give me a shout if, if I need to stop. Uh, and if you see somebody else waving, give me a shout because I've got nearly everybody on my screen, but not everybody, so that's great. Thank you. So <clears throat> just to remind you, it is uh, the responsibility of school to ensure that all staff and regular volunteers more people coming in, sorry. Um, have access to adequate, suitable. Just letting Sue, Elaine and Louise back in. Okay. Um, training to fulfill their role to safeguarding ch children. Um, now the guidance states that that should be delivered on a regular basis with updates at least annually. Um, so it's a minimum of a three yearly cycle. However, best practice, which is what we like to do, is that updated safeguarding training should be delivered annually. So that's what we do. And that's why we're here tonight to fulfill our, our requirements for safeguarding. OK, so um, I know that Sean's already um, filled his answers in for this, but if you got your training handbook, um, you should have had. Let me have a look where we at. Um, and there we can't find it. Craig, have you let um, Louise in, in the waiting let, room? Yes, I have. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, I can't see you. Okay, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to find the Word document I was looking for, um, which is there. I'm just not sure why it's coming up. So I just wanted the participants' handbook. So if you've got your participants' handbook in front of you, um, let me just share again. All the teachers are now thinking, gosh, what's he doing? Not as... Not as uh, Swish is all the teachers today, I know that, right. Okay, so uh, I've just put the uh, participants handbook up, which hopefully you've got in front of you. If you haven't, you don't need it because we're gonna use the bits on here. So um, this is just some questions to think about actually that are worth just looking at um, before we start. So um, we've all, I hope you've all um, read and understand our safeguarding and child protection policy that we went through in September. Hopefully, you're all familiar with our child protection procedures and how to report any concerns um, and how things can be escalated. We, we will be going through that tonight. You know how to pass on concerns um, and there's an agreed format for that. And the form's available from me, but there's also copies in the staff room. And hopefully you, you know our school behavior policy, our code of conduct. Uh, you know how to report a concern about another adult's behaviour through our whistleblowing policy. And um, you're also familiar with the, the wider safeguarding policies uh, that are linked to that, such as, as I say, the whistleblowing um, and any other policies we've got that are linked to safeguarding. So um, if I just move that down, the first activity was um, around... Um, answering these questions. So we just do this quickly, it's just worth going through, I think, to remind ourselves. So um, I think if we just, rather than giving you five minutes and saying, come back to it, let's just do one at a time. So all child abusers come from deprived backgrounds and have a below average IQ. So does anybody false. want to false. unmute? False. false. Lots of people coming in with false. And that's right. False. Abusers come from a wide range of social backgrounds, as we know. They may well, may well be married, well-liked, well-respected members of the community. Um, a key feature is often their ready access to children at home work or through volunteering, um, unfortunately. Um, the additional stresses caused by poverty, social exclusion, poor housing and unemployment can contribute to the abuse of children. Um, and child abusers have a range of IQ abilities, we know, and come from a range of intellectual backgrounds. Um, girls are more likely to be sexually abused than boys. True. No. 
true. That is true, Sean. Well done. I know you've been doing your homework, but it is true. This is <laughs> it's a bit out, it's NSPCC data from a few years ago now, but um, data collected on lifetime rates suggests that approximately 10% of all girls and 5% of all boys experience some form of sexual abuse before they reach the age of 18. Um, so that would suggest that girls are twice as likely as boys to be abused. Um, but that might be due to underreporting, um, particularly where older boys are concerned. So number three, all physical injuries on a child, such as bruises, are a cause for concern and should result in child protection referral. False. false. Yeah, false. Thanks, Kim. Uh, it's you know, children do have accidental injuries. It depends on the age of the child. Uh, it depends what the injuries are and where they are and how often they occur. And I think uh, you know, if staff are concerned, if you are concerned or uncomfortable with what, with what you see then that's, and you know, we have had these, these discussions in the past, that's when you should discuss that with your safeguarding lead and just have a chat, maybe monitor, maybe log that, just in case uh, we need to come back to it if, it, if it happens again and again and again. <coughs> um, children are more likely to be abused by someone that they or their family don't already know, number four. False. That is false. Yeah, it's actually, you know, um, research indicates that on average, 10% or less of sexual abuse is perpetrated by strangers. You know, the vast majority of children know the abusers, which again, I know is really difficult uh, and it's really sad, um, but that is the case. Um, grooming processes uh, will include the grooming of potentially protective adults. Number five, children often make things up, so we must take what they say with a pinch of salt. False. Again, obviously that's false, yes. Um, it might be due to displacement or misinterpretation, but children need to be taken seriously, uh, no matter how bizarre or unbelievable what they're telling us and the matter investigated. Um, very young children are particularly vulnerable to abuse, number six, tricky one. What's your name? Yeah, it is true. Young children are dependent and physically vulnerable. Under ones are five times more likely to be murdered than at any other age. Infants under the age of one and teenagers aged 16 and 17, interestingly, are the most vulnerable to a maltreatment related death. That was um, true. true. Babies were most often murdered by their parents, whereas teenagers were often killed by their peers. Um, in the UK, on average, as many three children each week die because of child maltreatment. Um, right, number seven, domestic violence mainly poses a risk to children because they might get injured if they're caught up in fights between adults. False. False. Domestic abuse is an immediate and, and very real sort of risk. Children who live in violent environments have been shown to suffer significant emotional trauma and can be said to have suffered significant harm just from seeing somebody else be abused. Um, myths include it was a one-off. Uh, you know, in over 80% of cases, there will be a second assault within five weeks of the first. And these then tend to increase in frequency and severity over time. Number eight, parents who have mental health problems are more likely to abuse their children. Yeah, probably true. False. False. It is false. I mean, parental depression is linked to poor outcomes for, for young children. Um, warning signs are parents having thoughts connected with the child. So it is something to watch, but it isn't, it isn't actually, um, it doesn't actually make it more likely. If you are worried that a child may be a victim of abuse, it is your job to investigate and prove, disprove it. False. false. Oh, it's not my job. It is false, yeah. Our job is to, to maybe spot some of the signs and symptoms, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's to alert your designated safeguard and lead, which is myself, or the deputy, which is Adam. And then we don't investigate it either. It's actually to refer that to people who can investigate things. So um, it's all our responsibility, uh, but we must be clear about who does what and when. So police 
and children's social care are the people who investigate possible abuse and crimes. It's not our responsibility, but is our responsibility to alert them to any concerns we have. Um, okay, and the last one, if you have any concerns about a colleague's conduct, it's okay to have a quiet word with them and say no more about it. No. False. Yeah, of course that's false, yeah. Um, concerns must be reported to the head teacher or to the chair of governors. And, and I hope staff are clear about our whistleblowing policy um, if that needs to be used. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll put the presentation back up now. Everybody okay? Yeah. Right. I'll just share. There we go. Right, okay. So I've been through that. These are the outcomes we're hoping to achieve. Uh, so let me get that out of the way. So proactive safe, safeguarding, what, what our role is in the safeguarding process. So we'll look at what safeguarding is and the different ways in which children can be harmed. Uh, Recognise what the signs and symptoms are and indicators are, sorry. Um, what we do and how, how, what's your role and your responsibilities uh, in terms of that in school. Okay, so we've done activity one, um, true or false. Just some of the legal framework and um, guidance. Um, the, the ones in red are the ones that are particularly um, important. Um, just stop sharing there again. The, the key document really in all our safeguarding is keeping children safe in education. I don't know if you can see me, but if you're looking at me, uh, that's the document. And it's updated every September. So this one was updated in September 2020. Now we'll touch on this as we go through, but it is important that every time we do the safeguarding training, we do consider the updates and the changes. So if I just... Um, alert you to some of those now. And I say, we will come back to them probably through the presentation, but just, just uh, again, we have touched on these, but just to remind you, um, there is a statement in there this year, obviously mentioning COVID-19 and links to current advice and guidance. Um, links to current legislation have been updated. Now, the key changes really are that the definition of safeguarding has actually been changed itself. Uh, if you remember, from preventing the impairment of children's health or development to preventing the impairment of children's mental and physical health or, or development. And that's just really placing a greater emphasis on mental health. And, you know, um, there, there are new section. there's a new section um, on mental health in, in, the, in the guidance. Uh, we're all seeing that, in, we're seeing that in school um, with some of our children who've got mental health problems. We know that some of the infrastructure, let's be honest, isn't there and we, we still have difficulty referring to CAMS um, and there are still some issues with the support in place, but I think there is a recognition of the, you know, the importance of mental health. Um, what hopefully we'll see as we go forward is, is the support and the infrastructure in place to help them with that. There's also new information ar around criminal, child criminal and child sexual exploitation. You remember child sexual exploitation was sort of the new thing and a, and a buzzword in safeguarding about five years ago. Then a couple of years ago, they started to talk about child criminal exploitation. Uh, well, there's some additional information around that. Um, there's some clarification around the LADO. And if you remember the designated officer and referrals to designated officer, uh, when there is a concern regarding a, a member of staff, that's just clarifying that it definitely, you know, includes supply and um, volunteer staff as well as permanent members of staff. Um, there's more information about data protection. There's some more information around keeping safe online. And there's lots of information from the DFE at the moment about supporting particularly children who are working at home and working remotely. Um, because obviously the children are spending more time on the computer. Um, 
there's uh, links to relationships and health education, which was a new area of the curriculum that became statutory in September. Um, and we've got our curriculum for that. Um, uh, so that's linked in to keeping children safe in education. There's some guidance to re reflect uh, Ofsted's updates and how Ofsted inspects safeguarding. Um, greater emphasis placed on the needs of children with social workers. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing that with um, some of the procedures we've got to go through with, with, with our own children who are under a social worker. Um, further guidance on mental health support. And honour-based violence has been changed to honour-based abuse because it doesn't always uh, involve violence. And there are some changes to um, a couple of the appendices that are quite important. So um, the information around uh, the role of the designated safeguarding lead and some further guidance on online safety as well is in there. So that, those are some of the updates and we'll perhaps reflect on those as we go through the the presentation. So I'll go back to sharing the presentation. Um, okay, so um, just let me get my handbook, sorry. But this is kind of just summarizing how it works really in terms of the legal framework. So um, so when there's um, unfortunately when there's a um, a child protection incident or, or a, a, a death or there's a um, there's a serious case review and lessons are learned and then a lot of the legislation we're looking at or we were looking at on that last page um, for example um keeping children safe, working together to safeguard children. A lot of that legislation comes from uh, major incidents and then legislation is released or amended, there's guidance and then there's regulatory bodies and then we develop and amend our policies and procedures as well. Um, so serious case review, then the relevant act, then government guidance. Um, we're not going to do that bit, but I will talk a little bit about some of those um, cases in a minute. Um, right, so if we just, just sort of, um, I'll stop sharing for a second as well. Okay, um, just in terms of our duty to, to comply with section 175 uh, for safeguarding, Schools have got to have a nominated safeguarding lead. Sorry, just letting somebody else in. Uh, ensure that staff and volunteers receive training, which is what we're doing now. Check the suitability of staff and volunteers to work with children. So that's our DBS checks and our safer recruitment. And have a safeguarding policy and make it available to all staff, volunteers and parents uh, so that staff can report concerns about the behaviour of colleagues, whistleblowing policy. So... Um, that that's what we're those are the four things we've got to do and that we do do okay so there's been a lot of legislation introduced and a lot of changes in regards to safeguarding in the last 20 years um many of these have occurred in response to high profile cases of tragic child deaths which gave rise to some of the concerns um uh, that's when we have the serious safe serious case reviews um okay uh and they determine what can be learned by agencies who have responsibility for protecting those who've been harmed. Okay, so the aim is to ensure that local professionals and services work together to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. And some of you may remember that last, um, last year, we did look at a local case of a, a, a local uh, teenage death and the lessons that had been learned from that. Um, not going to, to go through all of those um, cases like Victoria Climbier and Lauren Wright, um, but I know some people haven't done the training before, so very briefly, just, just to give people an idea of where, what can go wrong and where it, what, what can happen. I'll just summarise the one case was the Lauren Wright one, because that did lead to significant changes in, in um, 
legislation. So Lauren was born in Hertfordshire in 1993, but led a very traumatic life. When she was three, her mother took her to Turkey on holiday, but abandoned her there. And up to that point in her life, Lauren had not met her, nat her natural father. Okay, so the British consulate managed to return Lauren to England and a case conference was held. Uh, she was added to the child protection register and eventually she went to live with her natural father in Norfolk. When Lauren was six, she and her father moved in with his new wife and her two children and Lauren began to attend the local village school. Lauren's teacher regularly saw lots of small bruises on her and about once a month, more major bruises that included a black eye, bruising to her face and scratches across her back. Lauren showed signs of physical deterioration for at least five months before she died. Her hair was falling out and her weight reduced from six stone to two stone. And tragically, she died in May 2000 after being repeatedly physically and emotionally abused at the hands of her stepmother. OK, um, let me tell you that. Um, so Tracy Wright, the, the stepmother, um, was found guilty of causing the death of Lauren uh, and received a 10 year sentence. Lauren's father, Craig Wright, was also convicted of manslaughter, although there was no evidence he'd actually beaten his daughter. And this is the key thing for us, really. What went wrong was that the, the head teacher and class teacher told the inquiry they didn't believe someone they knew could harm a, they knew could harm a child, because obviously, um, the stepmother was um, a teaching assistant, um, a playground assistant at midday in the school. So she actually worked in the school um, and that was one of the barriers to it being reported. Communication between agencies was non-existent. There was no checking out of explanations. The class teacher was an NQT and hadn't had any safeguarding training, so didn't know what to do. So the, the serious case, case review highlighted poor interagency communication, conflicting opinions regarding Lauren's injuries, poor practice amongst professionals and inadequate or no training in child protection. Uh, the failure of the school to follow the local authorities' child protection procedures led to the statutory duty in all schools to safeguard and promote the welfare of children. So that's the section 175 I referred to before of the Education Act 2002 and further guidance for schools and that's keeping children safe in education that we've just been looking to and, uh, through and going through so um that's sort of the important bit where it comes from and you know it's not nice to think about some of those um sort of quite, or quite sort of famous or uh, cases now but it is important just to reflect on them for a minute and think um when we're talking about our safeguarding procedures that you think actually I do need to talk to Craig about that, or I do need to report that because you'd much rather think, um, not you're not going to say what if, you know, if something happens, you'd rather report it and nothing happen than not say anything and then something happen. Um, okay, so back to definitions. And again, I know some of you are very familiar with this now, but when we're talking about child protection and safeguarding, sometimes people do sort of get mixed up um, the safeguarding is like the, the umbrella canopy, if you like. It's the overarching um, policies, procedures, and then the umbrella handle, what we need to grab hold of, that's the child protection policy uh, and the direct procedures. So safeguarding is about protecting children from maltreatment, preventing their impairment of their, of their mental and physical health, uh, ensuring they're safe and they've got effective care uh, and we take action so that, that supports them achieving their best outcomes. So that's what child protection is, a part, it's a part of safeguarding, a part of promoting welfare um, and it's, it's the specific activity to protect children who are suffering or likely to suffer significant harm, you know, and, and, um, and in school we sometimes uh, as a senior leadership team or I, when I'm talking to colleagues um, we'll, we'll quite frequently um, in terms of making a decision of whether to refer to IART uh, we'll talk about whether 
we are whether a child do we think they are likely to suffer significant harm do we think they're at risk okay so child abuse um is when uh either intentionally or unintentionally a child's basic needs are not being met okay and a basic the basic needs are physical care and protection from harm love and security praise and recognition and intellectual stimulation and development okay um so definition of abuse uh so um abuse can be deliberate like burning with a cigarette for example or it can just be failure to act responsibly so letting your child play out all day without knowing where they are or who they are with. Um, these are quite shocking statistics, really. Now, I always say this, I know, but just, you know, one or two children die each week as a result of abuse or neglect. We don't hear about most of them, but that's the stats. Um, and around one in five children, 20% suffer abuse. So if that's the case, then there are around about 42 children in our school that are possibly or probably being abused to some degree, which is quite difficult to think about. Around half of the children who suffer abuse won't tell anyone about it when it's happening. Um, we said that disabled children are more likely to be, be, be abused because they're vulnerability and one in five children have seen content online they found worrying, nasty or offensive. And, and we have some experience in school of children who've been uh, subject to content that is inappropriate. So who might abuse? And this is an important thing to emphasize, as we've already said, it's it, it very likely to be a family member, a parent or a relative, a family friend or a neighbor, a trusted person, so somebody the child knows well, possibly a coach, um, a social worker, a group leader. Um, a number of adults can work together to groom um, or to work together to plan sexual abuse. And it could be a child or a group of children. So this is something most of you will be quite familiar with now. But we are just going to look at the different categories of abuse because every... every um, referral to, to IR uh, that we make that the uh, social care will um, categorize if you like uh, the type of abuse whether it's physical emotional sexual abuse or neglect so we'll take physical abuse first so physical abuse is the hitting shaking throwing poisoning burning or scalding drowning suffocating or otherwise causing physical harm to a child okay uh, it can also be when um, a carer uh, fabricates the symptoms or deliberately induces illness which used to be called uh, Munchausen's by proxy um, now it's just called fab fabricated illnesses and again that's something I think we have some um, experience of in school or some concerns that that might be happening in school so Seeing the signs, this is really important. So um, if you've got any unexplained injuries or a child who won't discuss their injuries or there are injuries that haven't been treated properly, or the, you know, which, which again, I can think of instances of that fairly recently in school. Um, improbable explanations, both from the child and then maybe if it's followed up with parents, from parents as well. Okay, changes in behaviour. Um, an important one to note here is that very often as class teachers, as teaching assistants, uh, uh, school staff, you will, in getting ready for PE or, you know, that sort of thing, or, or when the children are getting changed, you, you may be the people who see this and raise these concerns, um, but not no circumstances should you, should you ask a child to remove clothing. Um, but um, obviously if you do see that 
that's the case where you do raise it with me or we get you to fill in a, a form, which I'll come back to later in the training. Um, attendance might be another issue. Uh, parents may keep children off school to hide bruises. Um, time is a key thing here. Really important that if you, if you see something you're not sure about, you refer it straight away. Um, you know, bruises do heal quite quickly, particularly in children and, um, you know, time is of the essence. If you've got any concerns, report it to your safeguarding lead. Okay, so um, there are always areas where children are going to get bumps and scrapes. So knees, elbows, where they fall, where they bump. Um, these are some of the areas uh, that might indicate that they are being physically abused. So I'll just give you a minute to remind yourselves of that. Okay, so sexual abuse. Okay, so forcing or enticing a young child, a young person to take part in sexual activities, not necessarily involving um, uh, violence, and the child may or may not be aware of what's happening. Um, so if we're thinking about sexual abuse, some of the signs and symptoms we might be thinking about. So again, it could be physical injuries, bruises, bites. Um, something we perhaps have picked up in the past, sexual awareness and inappropriate to a child's age, might not, not necessarily indicate abuse, but would still be something that would be of concern and you'd want to log and perhaps discuss with parents. Obviously, links here to emotional abuse as well, ch changes in children's behaviour, uh, withdrawal. Some of the signs, some of the, the things we're looking for are the same things, whatever the form of abuse really, because th there will be some emotion, some emotional, uh, some trauma involved in any type of, uh, any form of abuse. Uh, and obviously then uh, the acronyms at the bottom, sexually transmitted infections or unitary tract infections. Um, links to child sexual exploitation here and child criminal exploitation, obviously, uh, you could add to that list unexplained gifts or, or money. Um, I think we'd be thinking there, as we sometimes talk about, it would be more of a high school issue. Um, so emotional abuse is a, is a part of all abuse. Um, but it's that persistent emotional maltreatment of a child. And, and this is going to... These... ACEs, as we talked about them in the in the in some training recently, those adverse childhood experiences, that trauma, is going to have an adverse effect on the child's emotional development for quite a long time, or maybe forever. So it, it is it is important if we've got any concerns about emotional abuse that we do we do try and um, report that. So signs of a child being emotionally abused, you know, really it's that failure to thrive, um, but lack of self-esteem, um, possibly self-harming, uh, which again, I have some experience of, and that, that's really, really not nice to, to see, um, but self-injury, and I'm sure others of you I know have, have experienced that, um, You know, again, changes in behaviour, overactive, aggressive, impulsive, uh, often very emotional and tearful as well. And possibly, um, and again, Link, we'll talk about this with neglect in a moment, possibly few friendships. So thinking about neglect, um, 
and again, something I usually talk about when we do this and, and we have conversations about this in school, the difficult one we neglect, I, you know, sometimes is the threshold for neglect. Um, you know, neglect is a persistent failure to meet those basic needs we talked about before. So it could occur even during pregnancy, um, but it could just be, you know, it's, it's failure to provide them with those basic needs. So, you know, food, clothing, shelter, um, protecting them from harm or danger, making sure they're adequately supervised and taking them to medical appointments. Um, something that we use a lot now, uh, and again, Linda will have some, has some experience of this through the TAF process, is the multi-agency risk assessment toolkit. Um, and in that toolkit are quite a number of um, assessment um, or profiles. And one of them is the graded care profile. Uh, alongside that, there's a home conditions assessment as well that social workers sometimes use. And that that is sort of, if you like, a checklist uh, and a scoring list of, of, if you like, how bad is it? Uh, and only if it meets the criteria or the threshold will social care get involved. So sometimes we might we might see some of these signs and symptoms, signs and, and, of um, neglect. Um, you know, somebody being, you know, poor hygiene, not very clean, um, hungry all the time, but actually it might just about be okay. And when social work look into it, you know, they're actually they're all just about all right, but it's just, it's that threshold that's difficult. And obviously when you're talking about any child that's not thriving and not, not being looked after really well, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? So, you know, we can all think of children who can, you know, poor appearance, um, not looked after properly, you know, not, not gaining in weight. Um, just the general look of the child has not been well, consistently hungry, um, you know, those of us that, uh, um, a lot of us that have worked in um, areas of deprivation or where there are, there is a greater degree of poverty uh, than we've got in Helsby, uh, we'll kind of almost know the look of some of those children who are, are neglected. Um, one thing this can lead to, from an emotional point of view, obviously, if they're presenting like that, they can be uh, an easy target for bullying. Um, and that can have a further impact on their health as well. So that, that really summarizes some of the, the signs and things that you should be looking for or be alert to in school, okay? Um, so the key priorities on safeguarding Uh, that have been really key, key new things over the last few years. So child exploitation, and I'd include in that child sexual exploitation and child criminal exploitation. So children, older children than we'd have in primary, usually being rewarded with gifts and money and treats, whatever, you know, in, in exchange for criminal activity, um, maybe linked to county lines and to drugs or sexual activity, um, child exploitation, domestic abuse, and uh, worryingly uh, figures from the government seem to suggest that um, in, in lockdown and in, since the COVID um, crisis, uh, the, the worry is that, there'll be, that domestic abuse has increased as well. Um, female genital mutilation and uh, honour-based uh, abuse uh, and forced marriage. Radicalisation and extremism. Um, we've covered this when we did the PREVENT training. Um, the, anybody who hasn't done the PREVENT training, the, the, the basic principles of that uh, radicalisation and extremism extremism training and um, prevent are exactly the same as safeguarding. If you've got any concerns about a child being radicalized or some uh, changes in behavior and worries, then you report them 
to your single point of contact or your safeguarding lead uh, to raise those and then those can be um, uh, taken further. And another obvious big one that we're all very aware of at the moment with lots of our children and young people um, and adults as well, um, many people struggling with mental health and general well-being. Okay, so just thinking about um, peer-on-peer -peer abuse and some of the things we've just been talking about, domestic abuse. If we talk about peer-on-peer -peer abuse, we talk about, you know, relates to young people aged 16 and 17 who experience abuse in their intimate relationships. So child sexual exploitation, we've talked about that. But it could be when it includes another young person. Similarly, harmful sexual behaviour. So any young person under the age of 18 who demonstrates behaviours outside of their normal parameters of development. And obviously this can link them to serious youth crime and violence. Okay, just going to stop sharing for a second. Before we go on to actually um, responding to need and actually what we do in school and take and listen and looking at a couple of case studies. Has anybody got any questions or anything they want to say uh, after that first couple of sections? No, everybody okay? Good. Okay, so. Um, so now we're thinking about responding to need. So most of you hopefully will be very familiar with that now, that continuum of need for Cheshire West and Chester. It has been updated and, and slightly changed um, from previous uh, versions. Um, Linda is probably the, the member of staff that's most familiar with this as, as part of the TAF process. But if you look at the bottom, um, hopefully you can see that the universal uh, is most of our children are in the universal. And then in the left-hand side, universal plus, that's children who might have one additional need. So they might have maybe some speech and language therapy. They might have been referred to CAMS. Uh, they might... Be, there might be an educational welfare officer involved. Now, this middle yellow amber section is really um, when the child and family require a TAF as they've got more than one. They've got two or more unmet needs. And if the level of risk increases, uh, we think about the red area. But So that's when um, a, a TAF's in, in use and school uh, very often lead on TAFs and uh, Linda is leading on a, a couple of TAFs at the moment and that's when we're working, trying to work with other agencies uh, and trying to do our best to make sure the children are being, uh, their basic needs are being met. Uh, if we've still got concerns uh, and the children are at TAF, it can be escalated to then child in need or um, child protection arrangements, which that both of those will involve statutory social work. Um, obviously, it doesn't have to go through that graded process. If there's a significant incident or um, child abuse or a domestic violence incident, uh, it could go straight to child in need or child protection without, without a TAF. Um, that's just quite a useful way to think about um, the child at the center and keeping a child safeguarding, safeguarded and well. And the three sort of strands are the, the parenting capacity, uh, the family and environmental factors, and then the, the child's needs. So um, very often when it comes to a, a TAF, we try and involve, you know, if needed housing or um, health to support us in, in, in helping the family. Um, something that some of you may like to refer to, but I, oft, I have to sometimes refer to, uh, what used to be called the Local Safeguarding Children's Board is now called the Safeguarding Children Partnership. And their website is where uh, Linda or myself would access the multi-agency assessment toolkit. Um, 
so the resources that designated safeguarding leads, TAF leads, and external agencies need, uh, maybe to make decisions or to know when to do referrals or get involved in multi-agency referrals, uh, a lot of that information is on that website. Yeah, so if anybody's interested, uh, that's that's where to have a look. Um, so that toolkit um, I talked about before, uh, in terms of neglect, is that graded care profile uh, and home conditions assessment that we have used uh, before. Um, thinking about domestic violence, again, there's a checklist. Uh, so for each of those areas we've already talked about, there are sort of support materials that would, would, would kind of give you an idea of if uh, referrals need to be made. So the integrated access and referral team, the IART team, that, that um, I think it's just good for you to have an awareness of what happens. Although obviously um, some of you may and can phone the IART team. Normally your concerns would be logged in our paperwork and would come to me or to Adam uh, and we would then uh, speak to IART. But there, are, there have been uh, occasions when some of you have had to speak to IART directly when something's happened. So if we're concerned about the welfare of a child or a family, uh, and we think they need multi-agency support, um, you know, that's when we might open up a TAF uh, or we might uh, refer to IART. Uh, and if we know that uh, a child or a family have been uh, subject to domestic violence and abuse, uh, we know about that through Operation Encompass, of course, and uh, if the police have been called out to uh, a family where there's been domestic violence, then an email comes to me um, so that we in school know and are aware of it and can then discuss that with the family and make sure the children are okay. Uh, so you get two options. Uh, one is if you're concerned about the welfare of a child, one is about domestic violence, and then the IAP member talks you through that and very often we might have to complete a MARF, a multi-agency referral form, and provide evidence through the toolkits I talked about before. Okay, so we're able to build the accurate picture of a child's life. Uh, and when considering to make that referral, we'll look about, we'll look at all the evidence we've got. So what's the degree and extent of the harm? How long has it been going on for? And that's why uh, when you're filling in your paperwork and your safeguarding forms, um, not always will we want to phone IART after one form's filled in, but if we're building up a picture over time, uh, that's when we might need to do that. Okay. Um, so, um, we have experienced sort of thought about young carers in the past and if a child's a young carer, um, that hasn't really been something we've had to think about much, hopefully over the last, last year or two. Private fostering, um, I'll just mention that. Um, that's when uh, there's a fostering arrangement, is it's, it's a child's under 16, uh, and if it lasts for more than like a month um, and it's somebody who's not a parent or with parental responsibility or a close relative. Okay, oh, sorry, that's when it is that. That's, that's a private fostering arrangement. Okay. Um, and it's not paid for or organised by the local authority. So again, that's just something else to consider uh, when, you, when you're doing this. Right, case studies. Um, just want to think about a couple of examples. Uh, and we can talk through these and you can tell me what you think you would do. Um, let me just find them. Um, case studies. Just bear with me a second. Um, there we go. Oh. Um, 
So the first case study, uh, there are about 20. I've just taken out a couple. So we'll look at number seven. Um, just in case you can't, um, I'll make it a bit bigger, but just in case you can't read that. Um, I'll read it through for you anyway. So um, year six pupil has received abusive messages on Facebook over the weekend. And again, we have had something similar to this uh, recently. She tells you it's a pupil in her class and she's upset by the things that have been written about her. A number of other children in the class also joined in the abuse. So um, what would you do? Anybody want to uh, to say what they think they do, or so? What would your next steps be? Where would you recall this incident? What longer term actions would you take? Shall I shall I chip in at this stage? And also to give you a break, Craig, um, I think, uh, and I have seen this in my class, yeah. um, my, you know, I remember first, my gut feeling quite often is to get frustrated that uh, year six children are on Facebook when legally they shouldn't be at that age. However, there's no point, you know, harping on about that. They are on it. And unfortunately, children can be nasty to each other. So uh, this has happened a few times already at Hillside. So, um, and so she she tells she tells you she tells me as a teacher uh, that there are people in her class, uh, and she's upset by the things that have been said about her. I have got a duty to listen to that, um, and what I do from that is um, I'll I'll quite often make I'll record it first of all, and I'll communicate it. So I've before now when it has happened, I've spoken to you, Craig. Yeah. Uh, we've discussed that and we've made a record of it. Um, they are children and so their parents are still responsible for them so the next stage would be um to sorry where would i record it well we've got um different forms of recording at school um we we're not using the cpom system at the moment but we have got um a day book and we've got files for each yearbook uh, each year group um, and so i record it there i'd make sure craig gets to see it uh, this is a file that gets reviewed by craig and myself um half termly um, but then I'd contact the parents because these are still children who are responsible, who's, who are, whose parents are responsible for them. Um, so that's what I'd do at that stage. And hopefully that uh, would bring that to the parents' attention. And quite often they then take over and do the right thing, either taking the child off Facebook or um, dealing with it um, with, with the other parents that are involved. Brilliant. Thanks, Adam. Ex exactly mm -hmm. right. And as you say, we have had, we have had to deal with something uh, like that in school. The only the only things I'd add to that I would, would be to to reassure the child they've done the right thing in telling you, um, and that you are going to be able to stop it happening again. So, uh, like you would in any sort of bullying incident or any incident like that, you'd reassure the children they've done the right thing in telling. Um, yeah, you mentioned obviously, you know, the age for Facebook really officially is thirteen. Now, we all know of children in our families and our school where they're on Facebook and other social media under the age of 13. I think if if parents, um, you know, you can take two two views on that. One, they shouldn't be and then and don't allow them. Or the peer pressure thing is really, really hard, isn't it? When all the friends are on and that sort of thing. So the the I think if parents are going to allow the children on under the age of 13, then they are going to have to say, um, you know, they're going to manage it and help them look after it and monitor it. And they can't just leave them to, to do it. Um, so at free will, um, that links in as well to not often sort of Facebook, but the online games they're playing. Um, and very often they, you know, on, on the Xbox or the PlayStation and they often involve, um, either text, you know, chat, where they're typing things, or actual just speaking to each other. And we, we, I know we've had some children uh, who have received some not very nice text messages, but also who have um, been spoken to and sworn at and things like that in, in group 
chats and things when they're on their Xbox and things. And again, that's about, you know, internet safety. And we'll come back to that when we talk about online safety in the future. But that's about parents policing that as well and children not being on their own in the bedrooms uh, for hours and hours and hours and left to their own devices. So um, I don't think I'd really add anything else to what, to what Adam said there. That, that was great. But um, I think I would, would make sure we spoke to the parents uh, of both the child who's been um, abused and of the children who were involved in doing the abusing or the bullying um, and actually speak to them. And obviously, I think we've got quite a good track record of uh, involving parents and speaking to both sides, if you like, and, um, and actually resolving some of these difficulties and, and, and moving on. OK, a little bit of a different one. So another case study. So you were concerned about a nine year old boy. Mum's a single parent and he's a very young mum. When she picks him up, she doesn't interact with him. Some other parents have been to you as the class teacher and have raised regards, uh, raised concerns with regards to mum's harsh language and a, a lack of physical warmth. In observing the disagreement with a friend during playtime, Connor responds disproportionately and shouts something not very nice. In speaking to Connor afterwards, you note he becomes very anxious that he's, and he doesn't want his mum to know that he's used bad language and spoken like that. But he does go on to tell you he's learnt these words from his mum, who speaks to him like that when he's naughty and tell, tells him that if he carries on being naughty, he'll be taken away from her. So what would you do immediately, anybody? Sorry, is anybody, anybody chip in with something there? About what would you do straight away? Speak to the child about what they've actually said. Yeah, you'd want to clarify and you'd want to record everything and write everything down. Sure, of course you would. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Assurance to the child that he's not worthless himself. Yeah, you'd be providing some reassurance as uh, yeah, and lots of this. Okay, yeah. We'd want to record your concerns on our, and we'll come back to this, our um, safeguarding pro forma. So on our method of recording concerns. And Adam mentioned the day book, which you've got a day book where we log any sort of incidents happening in school. Um, and then anything that's more sort of serious, we have got a safeguarding concerns pro forma. Uh, the sum up on the staff notice board in the staff room uh, and then I've got them in my safeguarding file and if you need a pro forma then you just you can get one from me or any of the you know safeguarding lead or senior person um, and you'd want to to write down everything that's happened on there um, we'll, we'll go through how to do that and what and, and how you interview and speak to a child and how you record it in a minute when we talk about procedures for doing that if you're not the designated safeguarding lead, which most of you aren't, then you would refer it to me or to Adam and fill that form in uh, and discuss the concerns and share some of the examples that you've got of what's happened. Um, now, the designated safeguarding lead would probably take, take over them, but certainly I would want, if that happened in school, I'd want to speak to mum and, and tell her, you know, the concerns we've got, share that, that um, what staff have seen uh, be totally honest and refer directly to concerns about emotional harm and well-being. And I'd want to know what support she's had. And, you know, we said she was a single parent, very young. Um, I wonder what, what support from a family she's got. Um, and would she like some additional support? Um, I'd be speaking to Linda and saying, do we need to open, I think we might need to open a tap up on this um, and think about specific activities um, that mum and Connor uh, might need to do to build up on the positives of their relationship. Um, a big thing when we've been doing taps recently has been thinking about the voice of the child and getting their, getting their, hearing their voice and giving them an opportunity to share their concerns and worries. So, um, 
if we did open the TAF, we then want to know, uh, do we need to involve school health, uh, any extended family, uh, are there any issues with housing? So all those other agencies that might help us support that family, because it's obviously not just a, a, a mum who's not very nice uh, and uh, the child who's copying her, that, you know, there's some, there's some bigger issues here. And what it's actually alerted us to is that we, that, that, that young mum might need some help uh, and we can actually hopefully signpost it to that. Um, obviously, all of those discussions and that 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 um, trail needs to be logged and, and will be kept in the safeguarding file. Uh, and obviously, just to remind those of you that 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 might not know as well, we as well as having um, our school-based staff, uh, like I've talked about, designated safeguarding leads. I've talked about Linda leading on the TAPS. Um, we've also got. Um, a family support worker who works across the Frodsham Villages uh, Schools Partnership, Sue Lee, uh, and she uh, is often somebody who Linda or myself might refer to, uh, if particularly if we think maybe thresholds for IART haven't been met, but we recognise there's a vulnerability and the child or family needs support, we might ask Sue to get involved. And that might be involved uh, in terms of uh, speaking to parents, visiting the home, um, finding out some more information about how, how conditions are at home um, and just generally providing some support for that family. OK. Great. Great. Can I just say something there? Yeah, um, of course. When you were um, when you were saying, you know, what should we do here? I could see the panic on people's faces. Now, I felt a little bit. Uh, anxious as well and that's because um you know we'd never be put in that position where we have to make a decision there and then and i think um you know common sense prevails here uh, when when we when we look at see what's going on you know when we're presented with this information common sense should always prevail um, and one message that should we should think about is to communicate it i'd never make a decision on my own no. um I'd, I'd definitely speak to you you've mentioned linda you've mentioned sue lee i've got gail as my ta there's, there's a number of occasions where I will just share that information straight away professionally um, and immediately that will give you a little bit more focus on the context of it. Um, and then obviously, again, I've mentioned communicating. We do that through recording it so that if things are repeated, then we can spot patterns um, and we don't get caught out that way. So I think you know, one yeah. message is don't panic. Um, yeah. I mean, and the other thing, when the, the last scenario you just mentioned there I was immediately thinking, well, what about hearsay? You know, what, what happens if it's just gossipy parents or nosy parents? Um, again, that's where communicating it with a colleague um, and talking to yourself as the lead or, or myself as the uh, second lead, and um, that's where we could discuss that and make make a sensible decision on it. The point that, is not to keep it Yeah, that's a really good point you make, Adam. Thank you. And one of the things I think we talk about, and I, I think, you know, when I'm when I've got one of my other hats on and I'm doing an Ofsted inspections and actually looking at whether safeguarding is effective in, in a school and I have to make that call. Um, and I'm pleased to say that nowadays, you know, near, most of the time, uh, all the time I, on the inspections I've done, the safeguarding is effective in, in all schools. But what we often talk about is a culture of safeguarding. And I think, you know, we've got a lot of... Um, experienced and um, careful how I use that word, you see, experienced staff and also very caring and staff. And we've got a real strong culture of caring for our children and, and our communities and our families and of, um, you know, expertise in that really and knowing kind of, you know, what to do. And I think, you know, Adam's right. You know, you might well talk to a colleague about it, um, you know, a trusted colleague and, and sharing that and saying, what do you think about this? Do you, you know, what would you do? And, and I think that's part of that culture of safeguarding that hopefully we've got uh, at Hillside. Um, and Adam's quite right to emphasise that. So thanks, Adam. Uh, anybody got anything else before I just, what I want to just go on to sort of finish is the sort of what, you know, just remind everybody so everybody's really clear about those the paperwork, if you like, and what to do and where we keep that and what you do if, if somebody does want to disclose, disclose something to you. So, okay, to, to carry on. Right, so um, we're up to 
Um, so what dealing with concerns, what do you do if um, you hear or see something that concerns you? Right, obviously don't ignore it. Act quickly. I mentioned before about particularly with physical abuse, time is of the essence. And if you wait a day or two, uh, and then I then look and I well, it's not what is it a bruise? Is it what you know? And then maybe it's too late to raise it with raise concerns with parents. Then use our form that I've referred to before, our safeguarding concern form. Uh, it, CPOMS is something that we have considered, and I think it probably moving to electronically and online is something we will do in the future. It's just it is quite expensive. Uh, it's something that we leadership team have discussed and we decided we'd we'd given the hopefully touch wood small number of cases where we've had to to refer to IR or we've had to um, to get involved where it's got more serious. We decided to leave it and, until after Ofsted, which has now obviously got postponed. Uh, so that's something we'll consider again later this year as to whether we move to an electronic system. What CPOMS does is um, if you fill a form in like I don't, it then sits in my office in uh, a locked cupboard, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and it's all logged there and that's fine. And everything, the paperwork's obviously, um, you know, systems I think are really strong and really good. What um, CPOMS does is when you log uh, an incident, it would then uh, be available or all the people that needed to see it would see it. So uh, class teacher, uh, designated safeguard and lead, senior, lead, you know, other people would be aware of it automatically. Any children that are related, so families, siblings uh, would, would be linked together so it is quite a good system and I have used it in a, in a couple of schools before. So that's something we may consider moving to in the future. If we do, then obviously I'll make sure that everybody gets trained in that. Um, OK, so what to do, speak to me or Adam uh, or a colleague as soon as you can. Um, and this is something hopefully you'll all be familiar with having done safeguarding training before. What to do if a pupil wants to disclose something to you and if they are worried. Uh, and if a child's come to you and wants to speak to you, um, then that's good. Uh, they obviously trust you and feel comfortable with you. And this could be anybody, uh, you know, it, it could be me, but it's more, just as likely or more likely to be one of, one of our midday assistants, teaching assistants, uh, who the children do have really good relationships with and may be inclined to speak to uh, more easily than maybe coming to see me in my office or anything like that. So uh, this could be any one of us. So obviously we stay calm. We offer that reassurance and we've talked about in terms of our body language, um, uh, listen to them and, and just really focus on what they're saying. Don't interrupt. Uh, don't try and rush them. Give them time. I know we're all... Um, very busy at the moment and it's hectic, but if something like this happens, we've got to try and give it time. Uh, they may want um, you to keep it a secret or, or ask you to not to tell anybody, uh, but you can say that, look, uh, you know, you want, you, you can trust, you can trust me. Uh, I want to help you, uh, but depending on, on what, what you um, tell me, I might uh, need to tell someone else. Uh, I might need to tell Mr. Richardson or I might need to tell Mr. Khan. Um, okay, offer that reassurance again, tell the child, child they've done the right thing. Um, and obviously, if it was the right time, you might want to refer them to other things like child line. And obviously, you speak to me. The things you don't do, obviously, are ask those leading questions and, and actually put words in the child's mouth um, or press for details. Give it time. You're not going to get involved in examining them or investigating We've said you can't promise to keep it confidential or secret. And don't really summarize. Um, I know that's something I, I, can, I can maybe do that when I'm uh, putting down my actions after I've got your form. But for your actual form, um, you need to write down the words exactly. And I know sometimes the form um, we use um, isn't exactly always fit for purpose, but you, most of the time you're writing on the back of it, aren't you, in that box? 
Um, and if you need extra paper, just go into extra paper and we can, we can stick it together. Um, but write down exactly what the child says. Okay, um, quite a useful thing to help you remember, useful mnemonic. Ted, uh, tell me about that, explain that to me, describe that, might be a useful thing that you can keep in your head. Um, okay, so just being really uh, sort of uh, empathetic really. Just thinking now about how and why children sort of might tell. Um, obviously the first and foremost, is they want the abuse to stop. They've obviously identified you as an adult they feel they can trust. And they're going to choose a time and a place that feels right for them, even if it might not be right for us. Um, you know, it might be the very end of the day before they go home and they've suddenly plucked up enough courage or when they're maybe worried about what they're going to see when they get home. And that makes it really difficult. Uh, but it, but it's got we've got to listen to them. And they'll use the the words that they, that they are comfortable with. Um, okay. What stops them telling? Just have a think about that for a minute. And I think obviously we all agree that it's probably fear. So they may have been threatened by the abusers or by the parents, by whoever it is that, that, that um, fear of punishment, obviously a bit of, uh, depending on the age of the child, guilt and shame. They may not, have, and I hope this would never happen, but if they felt they hadn't had the opportunity to be heard, so hopefully in our school, in our, um, with the ethos we've got and the fact that the children do uh, enjoy coming to school and are happy in school, I think they, they would feel as if they could definitely have the opportunity to be heard. Okay, we wouldn't want somebody to try and tell us, but not hear it. Okay, and they may not know um, that it isn't normal. Frightening thing, they may not know that they're being abused. So record keeping, um, this comes out again, we started right at the beginning with case audits and serious case reviews. Um, so in when good practice has happened, so records are up to date. They are formalized. They are confidential. And uh, the um, safeguarding file is kept locked in my um, office and in my cabinet. Um, so we clearly evidence the voice of the child and the, what the impact has been. Uh, they're written by you, who, who, who uh, the child's disclosed to. Uh, and then in the actions that I take in the section that I complete or Adam completes, we may then refer to, to communications with IART, to multi-agency risk assessments and to any assessment tools that have been used. So what needs to be recorded, and, and this is very clear um, on the form. So uh, obviously time and date. Uh, it says capital letters there. I, I wouldn't insist on capital letters. That can take a long time. So as long as it's neat and legible, um, then that's fine. I know um, some people, Stella especially, would, would, in, would query whether I could fill it in neatly. But in a case like this, I think even I could make sure my handwriting was neat. Um, really accurate record of what's been seen. On our form, uh, there is a body chart. Uh, Rarely we use that really, but that's there if there's been some physical abuse and you need to record where you've seen the, bu the, the bruise um, or, or the injury. Okay. And make it really clear and unambiguous. And then on there, I will record um, any decisions that we've made, any actions that have been taken, like uh, spoke to speak to parents and then I'll log the outcomes of what's happened when I've spoke to parents. And then you'll sign that you're, uh, to um, before you pass it on. Um, so make sure who you've spoken to in that position, will that be me? Chronology should be uh, significant events. Okay, so I'll, um, records are kept together. So if you filled a form in 
um, and then somebody else has as well. I'll collect those together. So when Adam and I, once, once every term at least, Adam and I will go through the safeguarding file and just have a look at um, the incidents and sort of different children and families. And if there's a picture building up over time, then we decide if we need to do uh, take anything any further. Um, and again, and this, this has been the case in the last few years, um, when there's been something that is involved in investigation uh, and child protection records may be requested for evidence. So they do need to be accurate and uh, neat and up to date and all those things uh, because somebody else may be uh, relying on them for something really important. Um, obviously all of the information is totally confidential and sensitive and we treat it very carefully as that. Uh, you'd only share this information um, uh, on a need to know basis with your safeguarding lead. And again, all the written evidence is, is subject to data protection legislation and it is stored in a locked uh, cupboard. So there's your seven golden rules. So data protection isn't a barrier to sharing information. We talked about being open and honest, the culture we've got of safeguarding at Hillside. Do seek advice from colleagues. Share when you've got consent. Consider safety and well-being. Okay. And some of those serious case reviews, you know, the one about, um, that I was thinking about is the Jeremy Forrest one. He was the guy who... Um, was widely reported in the media after he went missing with a female pupil aged 15 and they were found in France in 2013. Some of you may remember that. He was found guilty of child abduction and five counts of sexual activity with a child. The school actually attempted to write uh, up records um, after the event or some of the agencies tried to do it after the event. So, uh, which obviously is, is not really good at all, but... Um, don't forget we are not working in isolation, uh, particularly if we've got concerns about a child's welfare, um, we work with other agencies uh, and I will communicate and, and, and get their help and their advice. And they're the ones who can uh, conduct an investigation. We don't, just to remind you of that. Okay, so thinking about protecting everyone, I have missed, uh, some of the activities out on this one because I don't think we need to do all of that again. So just reminding you really about protecting yourself uh, before we think about protecting others. Um, obviously, you are the ones who are in a good position to observe those signs of abuse we talked about before. Due to your relationship with children, though, you're also vulnerable to allegations of abuse and mistrust. So they might be false or malicious, but in some circumstances, they're true. So um, do be careful and don't put yourself in vulnerable position. So most, very often, you know, you see my door wedged open. If I'm talking to some children or particularly an individual um, child who may want to come and talk to me, uh, I'll have the door uh, open. Um, if I'm going to be doing it for something particularly uh, sensitive, uh, or a period of time, I would ask a colleague to sit with me as well, just not putting myself in a vulnerable position. Um, you know, often uh, some of the allegations could be due to an experience or a mistake, um, but it could be that it was a deliberate harmful or abusive act. So, um, whistleblowing, I think you're all very familiar now with our whistleblowing policy in terms of if you've got concerns, about a member of staff, um, then obviously you raise that in good faith and not out of malice uh, and it would be taken seriously. Okay, so we've got an open and transparent environment. Like I said before, uh, don't think what if I'm wrong, think what if I'm right. Um, the designated officer for the local authority um, uh, for allegations against adults, um, is in place, that's a, a county-wide procedure. What happens when an allegation is made, just really briefly, um, 
So I'd basically uh, find out what's happened uh, and assess could the incident have taken place. Then I have to think about has the individual behaved in a way that's harmed or may have harmed a child, committed a criminal offence, uh, or anything that's posed a risk of harm, or means they're not suitable to work with children. Uh, and if the answers to those are yes, then we would contact the designated officer. Okay, talked before about where safe working practice, touched on this about when you might be vulnerable. So working alone, so try not to be alone or make sure you, you, you're in an area where other people are around. Uh, when you're administering first aid, obviously, but again, um, protocols for that. A child seeking affection. Uh, obviously, this is perhaps more difficult. Uh, you know, a lot of the very young children are very um, touchy-feely and do want a hug or do seek affection, and that can be difficult. Um, but again, just be careful. Um, we don't often need to restrain a child. Some of us did do the team teach training a number of years ago. Um, obviously, that's a really difficult one in schools where you do need to restrain children. Uh, if you're providing personal care or there's a lack of training or you're unclear about procedures, hopefully that's not the case. OK, but, you know, so do report or seek advice. Uh, and do record any concerns, okay? Um, and I think the culture and the ethos of our school would mean that would be very unlikely. Um, so make sure you're familiar with our policies and procedures. Okay. Open and trans behaviour, high standards of personal conduct, which we would expect at all times. Don't behave any way to com compromise your position. Um, we emphasised in that, obviously, in our professional relations policy, that your behaviour sort of in and out of school is obviously important. Um, policies and procedures. Obviously, don't share personal mobile numbers or details with a student. And we've been through, when we talked about the social media policy, um, you know, the dangers of social media and what to do and what not to do. So this is what hopefully we do as a proactive school with Safeguarding. It's got good relationships. Um, pupils regularly involved in decision-making when we're talking about bullying and the pupils do have a voice. We've got, a, when we can, we've got a really active school council. We've got some brilliant positive adult role models and a fantastic positive school experience where the children can succeed. We do use our curriculum to promote safeguarding and safe messages through relationships and health education and through our computing curriculum. Uh, and just that is the culture really, that it could happen here and we just need to, to be aware of that. So this was what we said at the start was the aims of the course So really understanding what safeguarding is and what is your role in that safeguarding process and how we can keep all our children uh, and our families safe. And just thinking the last few, just, you know, in terms of, you know, keeping yourself safe as well. That's support um, if you like, in school, obviously myself, uh, outside of school, the, the Safeguarding Children in Education team, uh, which is led up by Kerry Gray at the moment. Um, and again, I get regular emails and updates from the Safeguarding team um, around updates in practice and procedure, any changes to things like Operation Encompass or any updates on uh, domestic abuse or any any safeguarding issues, they're, they're in regular contact. But if you have any concerns uh, and you want to get support outside of school, there's some of the ways you can do it. Uh, team around the family. Okay, obviously at the moment, Linda leads on that for us. Um, 
and we do seek advice from our TAF advisor. Um, so the really last message is you have got a really big part to play in safeguarding children. Um, so be vigilant, listen to them and pass on your concerns. And Adam talks about, you know, working with colleagues and talking to colleagues and, and not panicking or not feeling uh, stressed. Um, do share and talk to colleagues. And the vast majority of our children and young people do live in loving and caring families. And I'll leave you with that quote before we finish. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Just about finished on time. Um, I'll get um, Stella and the office to, to issue a, a certificate for today's date, which officially lasts for three years. Um, and I'll put it on your in your personnel files as well. Um, anybody got any queries or questions before we finish? Sorry, it's been a bit of a a bombardment of, of my voice, but I hope it was uh, a reminder and a, and a, a useful uh, reminder. And uh, it's good to know that we've all done that training. We can all tick that box. So thanks very much, everybody. Stay safe and uh, I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Bye. Bye. Bye.